A piece of uranium ore is on prominent display at the Beijing Research Institute of Uranium Geology. The exhibit is popularly known as the origin of China's nuclear development. Uranium is fundamental to achieving nuclear fission. In the autumn of 1954, the Ministry of Geology discovered uranium deposits in Guangxi, in the south of the country. A sample of the uranium ore was sent to Beijing, where it eventually ended up on Chairman Mao's desk at Zhongnanhai. Mao took the ore sample in his hands and tested its weight. Fully aware of its importance, he said, this rock will determine our destiny. On January the 15th, 1955, Mao Zedong presided over an enlarged meeting of the Secretariat of the CPC Central Committee. Scientists Li Su Guang, Chen San Chang, and Liu Jie delivered reports on the development of China's nuclear science research and the problems it faced. Chairman Mao commented, just imagine that everyone sitting here today is an elementary school pupil. Your task today is to give us a lesson on nuclear science. While Li Su Guang held the black and yellow uranium ore sample, Chen Sang Chang conducted demonstrations on it using a radiographic instrument. Chairman Mao said that since the matter was of great urgency, no time should be lost. As long as China had the talent and resources necessary, it should reach for the stars. It was at this meeting that the party central committee reached the decision to develop China's nuclear industry as a way of consolidating the country's national defense capability. Mushroom clouds that appeared above Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan had accelerated the end of World War II, but they also triggered a nuclear arms race. By the time the People's Republic of China was founded, the world had already entered the nuclear age. The Western nuclear arsenals were a source of constant concern for the Chinese people. In March 1949, even before New China was founded, Zhou Enlai met nuclear physicist Chen Sun Chang. He listened to the scientist's thoughts and then gave him the task of buying a set of equipment and books from France to help with China's nuclear research. Following the founding of the People's Republic, more than 1,500 intellectuals living abroad made the decision to return to China. They wanted to contribute to the nation's rejuvenation. They became the foundation on which new China's scientific research was built. In 
1955, with the support of Premier Zhou, leading scientist Chen Shi-san returned home from the United States. He immediately submitted a proposal that China should develop its missile technology. In 1956, China published its first long-term plan for scientific and technological development. It listed the peaceful development of nuclear science as one of 12 major tasks to be tackled. The report also detailed two specific major projects, missile development and atomic research. In April that year, at an enlarged meeting of the political bureau of the CPC Central Committee, Chairman Mao said, we've grown much stronger than before, and this growth will not stop now. We will not only have more planes and artillery, we must also have atomic bombs. In a modern world, we must have them if we are to ensure that we will no longer be pushed around by other nations. China's research would cover nuclear weapons, missiles, and satellites. The nuclear research would cover both atomic and hydrogen bombs and would proceed in several phases. In April 1956, Premier Zhou presided over a meeting of the Central Military Commission. He listened attentively as Qian Shi-san presented a plan for developing nuclear technology. Following the meeting, the Commission of the Aviation Industry was established under the Ministry of National Defense. The commission, headed by Nie Rongjun, was responsible for developing both the aviation industry and missile technology. In October 1956, the Fifth Research Institute was established under the Ministry of National Defense. Also known as the Missile Research Institute, it was led by Qian Shi-sen. Soon afterwards, the Nuclear Weapons Research Institute was founded. It brought together many of the industry's leading nuclear physicists. With the necessary institutional framework established, New China was in a position to create a nuclear research and experiment base and the associated industrial enterprises. In wave after wave, the country's war veterans marched to factories, mines, and research institutes with the same revolutionary fervor and honorable traditions that had sustained them on the battlefield. They were now supporting a new cause, the modernization of China's national defenses. In secret, hundreds of thousands of former soldiers and workers made their way to the railways and construction sites of China's northwest. In April 1958, construction began of a missile launch base in Jiuquan, Gansu province. The location of the nuclear weapons experimental base was decided. It would be Lok Nor in Xinjiang. Subsequently, more than 100,000 scientific researchers and military personnel bid farewell to their families and friends and left their hometowns. They made their way to the vast expanse of northwest China, where they would develop the country's atomic and hydrogen bombs. Nine out of ten of them were below the age of 35. Living conditions were extremely harsh. In the summer, the temperature rose as high as 60 degrees. When the wind blew, it could be strong enough to destroy tents. Pebbles caught up in it could shatter windshields. Water was so scarce that what they'd used to wash their faces in the morning had to be kept until the evening for their feet and then saved for the laundry later. One researcher later recalled, everyone at the base lived in cellars no more than a meter high. It wasn't too cold, but there was a constant trickle of sand from the roof. Elsewhere, people slept on sheets but here, we had to hang up our sheets to stop the sand coming in. 
newcomers didn't understand why this was necessary. But after their first night, they'd be only too well aware. If they didn't arrange to sleep like this, they'd wake up with their mouths and noses full of sand. Even eating was a challenge in those cellars. Everyone crouched over as they ate, covering their bowls with their bodies to prevent the sand from getting into their food. Initially, China received technical support for its missile and atomic bomb development from the Soviet Union. On October the 15th, 1957, the two countries signed the New Agreement on National Defense Technology. The document stated that from 1957 to the end of 1961, the Soviet Union would provide China with technical support in areas such as rocket and aviation technology, as well as atomic bomb research. Soviet support was crucial in the formative stages of China's missile and atomic bomb development. However, in June 1959, against the backdrop of mounting tension, the Soviet Union suddenly informed the CPC that all technical support relating to China's atomic bomb development was being withdrawn. Overnight, the Soviet government effectively tore up a dozen bilateral agreements and hundreds of contracts. It also recalled all its experts from China. Many major research projects came to a sudden stop, and work had to be halted at a number of key construction sites. In the wake of these events, China's first atomic bomb research was given a new code, one that people will always remember, 596. China was facing severe economic difficulties at the time. High-tech national defense projects represented a huge drain on the national budget. Opinion was divided as to whether these projects should be continued or not. But Chairman Mao's instructions were unequivocal. We must continue with high-tech projects at all costs. Nia Rongzhen was also very firm on the matter. We must have the atomic bomb, the very symbol of high-tech weapons. The development of this bomb will lend itself to the modernization of many other technologies in China. People were unwavering in their determination to make their country stronger. New China had been reborn after a difficult past. Now, with their heads held high, its people would continue firmly down the path they had chosen, whatever the challenges and difficulties. Eighty-three days after the Soviet scientists left, China carried out a successful test of its first domestically produced ballistic missile, the Dongfang-1. It was an historic milestone for the People's Liberation Army. In November 1962, the CPC Central Committee decided to form a 15-strong specialist committee under the leadership of Premier Zhou. The committee was responsible for overseeing all missile and satellite research. At 3 p.m. on October the 16th, 1964, China exploded its first atomic bomb the sound would reverberate across the world. At 8.20 a.m. 
on June the 17th, 1967, China successfully tested its first hydrogen off. Go. Ba. Gui. Liu. Wu. Si. San. Liang. Yo. Chiba. From the first atomic bomb blast to the first hydrogen bomb explosion, the US had taken seven years and three months, the Soviet Union four years, the UK four years and seven months, but China took just two years and eight months. Commenting on China's development of an atomic bomb, Western reporters sneered that the country may have the bullet, but it had no gun to fire it from. American Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara had predicted that China wouldn't be able to produce anything capable of carrying a nuclear payload within five years. But again, the world underestimated China. Three months before testing its first atomic bomb, China had already acquired its own medium-range ballistic missile. On June the 29th, 1964, a Dongfang-2 missile was successfully launched. In March 1966, the Committee of Specialists gave the go-ahead for an integrated atomic bomb and missile test launch. At 9 a.m. on October the 27th, 1966, a nuclear-armed Dongfang-2 missile took to the sky. Nine minutes and 14 seconds later, at a distance 894 kilometers away from the launch site, the nuclear warhead exploded, 569 meters above its target in Loch Nor. China now possessed nuclear weapons and the means of deploying them. That same year, China established a strategic missile force, the Second Artillery Corps. China's strategic missile development progressed from short and medium to long range from liquid to solid fuel, from land to sea-based, and from fixed to mobile launch sites. A range of strategic missiles were developed and deployed, capable of responding to any military eventuality. In June 1958, Chairman Mao and the CPC approved General Nia Rong Jun's proposal for conducting research into the development of nuclear-powered submarines. Ten years later, in 1968, China began construction of its first nuclear submarine. Then, 20 years after that, on September the 15th, 1988, China successfully conducted its first trial launch of a missile from a nuclear submarine. China could finally deliver a missile strike from a nuclear submarine. In the event of nuclear war, it now had a comprehensive response capability. While China was still making breakthroughs in its atomic weapons development, the rivalry between the major world powers had already moved into outer space. At 21.35 p.m. on April the 24th, 1970, 
the satellite Dongfang Hong-1 was launched towards the stars, carried on a Long March 1 rocket. After the US, France, Japan and the Soviet Union, China became the fifth nation to launch a satellite into space. As of March 2019, China had employed eight different versions of the Long March carrier rocket. 300 launches had placed more than 200 satellites in orbit. These satellites serve four major functions, geographic survey, communication and broadcasting, GPS, and scientific research and experimentation. As they look back, the Chinese people can reflect on one remarkable achievement after another in nuclear and satellite technology. But every step of this epic journey has been taken in silence and extreme secrecy. Deng Ying Chao, the wife of Premier Zhou Enlai, once explained that she first heard about the successful atomic bomb test when it was publicly announced. Zhou hadn't shared the secret with anyone, not even her. Deng recalled that Zhou had stressed to the person in charge that the project was classified as top secret. The relevant information should only be conveyed to those participating in the project and the tests on a need-to-know basis. Nobody should ever reveal their involvement, not even to their closest family and friends. Eventually, China's achievements would become known to the whole world, yet the people behind them would remain anonymous. Such was the path taken by the numerous researchers and scientists who participated in the nuclear weapons project. Nuclear physicist Deng Jiaxian was the first to be ordered to the experimental base. Leaving behind a family photograph at his home, he simply vanished. That year, he was just 34. On the night he said goodbye to his wife, he told her, I'm dedicating myself to a job I have to do. This will be the event that will give my life meaning. It was August 1958 when Deng Jiaxian arrived at the experimental base in the Gobi Desert. He'd set out from home without leaving a mailing address. His wife spent the following years not knowing where he was or what he was doing. In a secret room, using just slide rules, Deng and his team ran repeated calculations on the key data for the atomic bomb detonation. In this way, they worked out the theoretical design. However, Deng suffered an accident that would cause severe damage to his health. During an experiment, he neglected to wear protective gear. Several years later, 
his condition became terminal. In June 1986, the hospital where Dung was being cared for reported that he was on the point of dying. Out of respect, the Central Military Commission declassified the reports on his work. The country's major newspapers carried his story on their front pages under headlines that described him as the father of China's A and H bombs. This was how his silent contribution, lasting 28 years, was honored. At 54, nuclear physicist Wang Gun Chang had just become famous for his discovery of the anti-sigma minus barrier. He was at the height of his scientific career. To participate in the atomic bomb research would mean giving up everything he'd achieved. And yet, with the simple response, I will dedicate myself to my homeland, Wang vanished from the international physics scene. Instead, a man named Wang Jing appeared at the Northwestern nuclear base to take charge of detonation research. In December 1968, 59-year-old Guo Yonghui, who was in charge of the project's theoretical nuclear research and development, set out for Beijing from the Qinghai Experimental Base on a work assignment. On the morning of December the 5th, the plane carrying Guo crashed while attempting to land. When his body was discovered, it became evident that in their dying moments, the scientist and the guards on the plane had embraced one another so that their bodies protected the document bag containing all his secret research. Due to the confidential nature of his job, Guo Yonghui had rarely spent any time at home with his family. When his young daughter had asked him for a present on her birthday, he could only point at the sky apologetically and tell her that from that moment on, there was one more star in the sky. That was his gift to her. In July 2018, the International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center officially named Planet Number 212796 Guo Yonghui to commemorate his life. Guo was also the first scientist in China to receive the title of martyr and to be awarded a medal for his contribution in the bomb, missile, and satellite programs. They dedicated their lives to the nation. Together, they created a glorious future. Their light shines upon the land, upon the republic built on blood and fire, and upon the dream of a new nation that will no longer be forced to bend its will to others. Under the leadership of the CPC, the bomb, missile, and satellite program brought together people from a broad spectrum of industries and backgrounds. By pooling their expertise and working closely together, they overcame manifold difficulties and challenges. By doing so, they demonstrated the ability of socialism by centralizing authority to work miracles. The success of the bomb, missile, and satellite program strengthened China's position on the international stage and guaranteed peace for the country the world. It was a demonstration of the nation's power 
and a symbol of its prosperity. People come and go, but the sky above us will always remain blue. The images of all those who gave their lives for the sake of the nation will be forever etched in the annals of the People's Republic of China. Yeah. 